So what exactly is prenatal genetic testing? Prenatal genetic testing, I think, is a kind of an umbrella term for any kind of test that's aimed at detecting fetal problems while the woman is still pregnant. And examples could be using ultrasound to detect spina bifida. Another category of genetic testing would be those aimed at fetal chromosome abnormalities, such as Down syndrome. And then a third category of testing would be ones that are aimed at identifying genetic conditions like cystic fibrosis would be an example. Why do you do the test? Well, as an expecting parent, you might very well like to know about an impending problem because of neonatal management of the problem, or in the case of a severe structural abnormality, it could lead to a decision to end the pregnancy. Most babies are developmentally normal and everything goes fine, but there are instances where that isn't true. The goal of prenatal testing is to try and identify those situations where things aren't going normally. One type of thing that comes up frequently is chromosome abnormalities. There's single gene disorders, and then there's structural fetal malformations. So our genes are contained in chromosomes, which are big chunks of DNA. If you have an extra piece of chromosome or a piece of chromosome missing, that this almost always results in multiple developmental problems in a pregnancy. A prime example of that kind of thing would be trisomy 21, which is well known as Down syndrome. There's an extra copy of a whole chromosome number 21, and it results in the constellation of features that we mostly all recognize as Down syndrome. So I'm 35 years old. Is age a factor when it comes to this testing? Well, yes, it is. Women over the age of 35 are considered to be at higher risk in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. The chances of a Down syndrome pregnancy at the age of around 20 are about one in a thousand or maybe a little less than that. And by the time you reach age 35, the chances of a Down syndrome pregnancy are closer to one in 250, so four times as high as when uh, the woman was 20. By the time she reaches the age of 40, about one in 100 or even maybe one in, in 75 pregnancies are affected with, with trisomy 21. The incidence of some other chromosome abnormalities goes up with maternal age as well. What are the kinds of tests for chromosomal abnormalities? Well, I guess they could be divided into two broad categories. The first category would be diagnostic tests, uh, where you get definitive answers about is there a chromosome abnormality or not. And those kinds of tests require doing procedures such as amniocentesis, which I don't know if you're familiar with amnio. No, no, what is that? Well, in amniocentesis, you use ultrasound to see where is the uterus and the fetus and the amniotic fluid. And then you use a needle to enter through the mother's abdomen into the uterus, into the amniotic fluid, and withdraw amniotic fluid that contains living cells that can then be tested specifically for chromosome abnormalities in the laboratory. Over the years, there has been an ongoing effort to try and figure out non-invasive methods to detect fetal chromosome abnormalities. One approach is to use the measurement of levels of serum hormones in the mother's blood, along with ultrasound measurements, typically of the back of the fetal neck. This kind of an approach can detect the majority of cases of pregnancies that are affected with trisomy 21, but it will miss some of the cases and it has lots of false positives. So more recently, people have developed a method that involves taking a sample of the mother's blood and using fetal DNA that's present in the mother's blood to assess for fetal chromosome abnormalities. And this kind of an approach has turned out to work better in the sense that it can be used to detect 99% of pregnancies affected with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome and a high percentage of other common chromosome abnormalities. And that's just like a blood test? It's just or? like a blood okay. test. The thing about it that patients need to understand is that first, it's not comprehensive. It won't detect all chromosome abnormalities, so it doesn't really replace amniocentesis. 
And the other thing they need to know about it, it can have false positive results so that if you get a result from that kind of test that says there's a fetal chromosome abnormality, it may at that point be very important to do a definitive test like an amnio to make sure that it's correct. A third thing that patients all need to understand about this new technology of testing is that it's expensive and insurers are highly variable about whether or not they'll cover it. Amniocentesis has the advantage of providing very concrete, specific answers to the question of is there a chromosome abnormality or not. But it has the disadvantage of coming with some degree of risk of causing miscarriage. Let's just say it's less than 1% and greater than one in a thousand. That puts it in context. So if we get all this testing done, we'll know everything there is to know and we'll be good to go? Yeah, well, this is a popular misconception that many people have. Um, we talked about chromosome abnormalities, and we're very good at detecting those and understanding their implications. We talked about single gene abnormalities, which we're pretty good at. But it turns out that the majority of different kinds of problems, the developmental problems that kids have are really not very well understood and aren't really predictable. I think it's easy to illustrate this with autism as an example. The vast majority of instances of autism, there's no real understanding of why it happened and there's no genetic or other testing to predict it occurring. So that by doing chromosome testing and carrier screening for recessive illnesses, you really have not changed the likelihood of having a child that's affected with autism spectrum disorder. So basically it will give us a good set of information, but we won't know everything. That would be a very good summary. Okay. So what other genetic issues are there outside of chromosomal? One other major category of, of genetic condition is ones that involve individual genes. To give you a sense of scale, a chromosome contains thousands and thousands of genes. A gene is microscopic. So if, for instance, if a chromosome were the size of the state of Vermont, a gene might be the size of a mountain like camel's hump. So one category of genetic disorder is the type that we've been talking mostly about, chromosomal, where the whole chromosome or a piece of chromosome is either missing or extra. The chromosomes are the home of something like 20,000 different individual genes and mutations in the genes can result in a different kind of genetic problem. A typical example would be cystic fibrosis, where both parents are carriers of a mutation in the cystic fibrosis gene, and they both transmit the affected gene to a pregnancy, and then the child that results from the pregnancy has two copies of the gene that don't work and is then affected with the condition, in this case, cystic fibrosis. There's about a thousand other conditions that are inherited in the same way, and we call this recessive inheritance. Okay. So what do we do now? What's next? Well, I think the concrete questions that face every woman who is going to have a baby, does she want to do any kind of testing for fetal chromosome abnormalities such as Down syndrome? And if so, exactly which kind of test? And does she want to do any kind of screening for recessively inherited genetic conditions such as cystic fibrosis or spinal muscular atrophy or many of the others that exist? So there were structural problems. There were a few types you mentioned. Structural fetal malformations such as spina bifida or a structural malformation of the heart, cleft lip and palate. Those types of things would also be ones where advanced knowledge could be very important. There's no way to predict which pregnancy is going to have any kind of structural abnormality of development. So really the only tool is ultrasound. An ultrasound performed sometime between 18 and 20 weeks is usually done in most pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So everything's an option. It's really up to me. Correct. What I want to do. Yes. Okay. And it's difficult because there's so many ins and outs and many issues to try and understand. But I can always ask you about that, right? Right, and we encourage all the patients, they should ask their questions and try and get them answered. And they can go, they can turn to their provider and if that's not sufficient, they can have consultation with a genetics person such as myself. Great, thank you, Dr. Brown.